Doko, just curious, what's your philosophy on like the the graders that stand up versus the hand that we're using right now? Uh, all preference. I like these because they take up less space in my closets, cupboards, you know? Mm. Like the box graders, we call those box graders. Um, ow! They're just, um, they're a little bit easier to use maybe, but yeah, they take up so much more space. All right, y'all, what am I doing first? Chicken soup or mac and cheese? No response, my favorite. Um, I would like the soup. Soup first, okay. <clears throat> so. Okay, here we go, everybody. <clears throat> Any questions before we start? Welcome to Toko's Kitchen. Today we gonna make the chicken soup. Chicken soup, good for your health. You can make with organic ingredients or you can use conventional. Uh, I forgot to smash some garlic, so I'm just gonna smash some garlic. I just take a clove, lay it flat, bam, and you've got smashed garlic. Uh, just a little bit easier than mincing, although sometimes you do need minced garlic. But I just want the flavor of the garlic and I'm okay if it just disintegrates in the recipe, so. Okay. I will try to give you quantities, but. As I mentioned, I don't really cook with recipes or quantities anymore. But check it out. Here's the concept of mise en place. I pre-measured everything out and this just makes everything go faster. I don't usually do this when I'm cooking this recipe just because I, you know, I do it so frequently, but I've got half teaspoon salt, uh, quarter teaspoon parsley, half teaspoon uh, thyme, quarter teaspoon paprika, this is an eighth of a teaspoon or so of fresh cracked pepper. And then I've got, I don't know, like six cloves of garlic smashed in here. So that concept of mise en place, it just saves you time organization. So you're not like, oh shoot, I need this, I need this. And you run the risk of like burning something. So here's what I do. So I've got two packages of organic chicken thighs. Again, you don't have to use organic. Um, I like bone in because, uh, and I like skin on, skin on especially because I can render the fat out of the chicken, which I'll show you in a second. But bone in tends to be a little bit more flavorful to me and also um, a little bit more juicy, fresh. I think it's just because um, once you, so they use a machine to take the bone out and it just kind of dries the meat out because it's a little bit more stuff exposed. So let me take you to this area. So I'm gonna do the chicken stew and the Instapot, right? Okay? just because um, this will hold at a food safe temperature until I need it later tonight. Um, so again, an Instapot, I think is a really good investment for a college freshman just because it, um, it simplifies the cooking process, right? So I'm just gonna go ahead and get this thing on. I'm gonna turn it on saute while I get my vegetables ready. I'm gonna throw some olive oil in there. How much olive oil? I don't really know. Maybe about a tablespoon, okay? So while that gets up to temperature, I'm gonna fly through my mirepoix, okay? So as I mentioned, a mirepoix is celery, carrots, and onions, yellow onions usually. And typically it's three parts onion, two parts celery, two parts carrots. But because I like the sweetness of carrots, I usually flip that and I'll usually do two parts onion, sometimes no celery, just because <laughs> my wife juices a lot with celery. So sometimes I'm not allowed to take it. Um, but yeah, that's generally the rule. But I generally put more carrots than anything because it adds sweetness without adding sugar. So this is how I do my onions. I'll cut this side off. I leave the root stem, root side intact. Cut in half like that. I'm gonna just peel this outside layer here. Now, just a little pet peeve. Don't be stingy when you peel away. If it looks at all like dry here, peel another layer because if that stuff gets in your mouth, it just feels like you're eating plastic. So don't be stingy when you're peeling away skin. Like this right here, I don't know if you can see this, like that needs to be not part of my soup. So I'm gonna do one onion, a couple of stalks of celery and a whole bunch of carrots, okay? So this is how I generally do my onions. 
Um, I don't cut all the way through. That way this part right here kind of operates like a handle. So I hope you can see this, but. So what I've done is I've kind of fanned it out like this, but I've not cut all the way through. It just keeps it together so that I can do this. And then I throw this away, my handle, but now I've got, let me get a clean bowl here. Now I've got this for my onions. Now, sometimes you'll see this stuff, this center root-like thing. I like to get rid of that stuff because it's um, not that pleasant of a texture in my soup. And you'll see it a lot in the center of onions, like right here. So sometimes I'll take that out. I'll do this other onion. And then I've got my onion. I'm gonna fish off these parts right here. Boom, okay, onions done. So I like to cook my onions separately. Like I'll sweat these first as I'll show you. I'll show you exactly how I do it, but you don't have to. You could throw your mirepoix, your celery, your carrots, your onions all in at the exact same time. That's totally fine. Woo. I'm crying over here, cutting onions. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna speed through some celery real quick. I only need about three stalks right here. So I'll give these a quick rinse. The part you want to rinse on celery is the inside root part right here. This is where all the dirt accumulates on the inside. So I like to give those just a good rub. And then a lot of people trim this part off right here just because it's cosmetic, but it doesn't really matter. You could eat it, it's fine. I just stack them. Instead of cutting in each piece individually, you can go faster if you kind of bunch them up together. Now, if this was a traditional French dish and I actually want a true mirepoix, I would have to cut these so that they're all cubes. So normally that would involve cutting this way, like this, and then making sure everything's uniform because you know the French, they're all about visual appearances. And, but for the soup, this is for my kids, so they don't really care what it looks like. And then in the end, the bottom parts, if you don't want them, just chop them. Oh, please do be careful if you're using celery in a disposal. Make sure the celery is chopped up. If you ever put like a whole thing of celery in there, it can bind up your, um, your disposal. So I'm gonna throw my celery over here. And then I'm gonna quickly peel some carrots. I wanted to try and do some of this beforehand, but I did have jazz too before this. So, um, you know, some people don't peel carrots and that's actually totally fine. It becomes just a texture thing. Like if you scrub your carrots really well, you don't actually need to peel them. Um, like, you know, it's not a, it's, it's clean if you scrub them, but um, I generally, put this over here. Okay, so I need a few minutes to do this. Questions so far? Any questions so far? Okay, don't mind me while I blaze through some carrots here. Oh, look at this. I've got like legs. So as I mentioned, a lot of stores like Trader Joe's, Whole 365, they sell pre-mixed or pre-cut mirepoix, celery, onions, carrots in a little like plastic tub. Um, and they also have it in freezer bags. Like I always have a couple bags of it in my freezer just in case, you know, I run out of stuff or, you know, I'm too lazy to do this part right here. But carrots are pretty cheap, onions are pretty cheap, celery relatively a little bit more expensive. These are some does tiny it matter, carrots. Oh, it doesn't matter like how finely you chop your vegetables. Yes, so um, I'm doing a stew, so I'm gonna cut everything a little bit more coarse. But if you're doing a pasta sauce, like say we're doing a sofrito, which is the Italian version of this, um, I would have to cut things much smaller, a much finer dice. Um, because, you know, if I'm having spaghetti sauce, like if you've had good spaghetti sauces, bolognese, whatever, you probably never really tasted vegetables because they kind of just, you know, meld into the, the soup base. So it depends. 
for a stew, I want chunky pieces of vegetable. You know, I want to be able to fish out a carrot if I want or whatever. All right, almost done here. Other questions? I welcome any questions. Now, I did not talk about like basic knife safety, and I guess we can, but I don't need to be on camera for that. So to maximize our time, I'll just do that later. Knife safety. Knife safety and knife techniques is an important thing. This is me using the back of my blade to scrape stuff off. So uh, here's my bowl of celery that I'm just going to combine like this. So I'll do like three or four pieces of carrots at a time, trim the ends off, throw those over there. Now, again, um, no matter what you're doing, you kind of want uniformity of size just for, you know, consistency. But since I'm doing this as a stew, I'm just doing that. Kind of like coin size. Oh, I just lost some carrots. Uh -huh. So I kind of just group these together in similar sized carrots. So real quick, I'll talk about this more later, but I'm using my knuckle as a guide and you'll notice that all my other fingers are tucked in so that I never have, well, I have a much lower chance of chopping off a finger because this is as far as my blade can go left and everything below it is behind my tucked finger. Alternatively, you can always get, um, what is it, um, gloves? Like I have some gloves here. Resistant gloves, you know? This is Sammy's cut resistant glove for when she helps me in the kitchen, little baby hand. Okay, so almost done with carrots and then we can get going here. And that's Isaac screaming at the top of his lungs. <laughs> Welcome to my kitchen. So uh, since you asked, um, what's your name? Nothing, sorry. If I wanted a true mirepoix, I would have to do this to all the carrots. I'd cut them and you know, do this. And some seriously high-end French restaurants, they'll actually make the carrot a rectangle first before they do it so that every single piece is a perfect square. Otherwise, if I cut this, you'll see here, like you can still see the rounded edge. Right, and that's fine, but some crazy French restaurants will actually make these perfect cubes so that you never see anything that's not square. A little extreme, especially for our purposes right now. How do you make celery not square? I mean, square. Um, celery is hard, but so what they do is they peel the celery. They actually take a vegetable peeler and, and peel it. And you just trim the edges and it's not gonna actually be square, but it's gonna be like a trapezoid basically. But like I said, you only see that in extreme places. So as you see here, I've got way more carrot than I do celery, but that's just because um, uh, carrots will lend extra sweetness. So let's go over here. It's time to render some fat. So I've got this thing on, let's see, where's my camera? Perfect. Bobo bad. So I've got some chicken thigh here. So skin side down into the, you can use either an Instant Pot, you could use a regular pot, you could use a fry pan, it doesn't matter. Skin side down such that the fat in the skin, we call the subcutaneous fat, we all have it. I have a lot of it from quarantine, but subcutaneous fat. So it's fat below the skin. So in doing this, we can render that fat out. And instead of using, say, a lot of olive oil or butter, we can just use the fat from the chicken. And the only reason we're doing that is flavor. It's not healthier. Um, olive oil would be the healthiest, but it just adds way more flavor. So I'm going to do some dishes over here as I go. This is a big kitchen thing for me, cleaning as you go. I don't like to have a huge pile of dishes afterwards. So I'm going to clean my cheese grater here. I'm gonna clean my vegetable peeler while that stuff's up hanging over there. And then whenever, so before quarantine, before, you know, we had three kids, I used to do private dinners. Like people would hire me and 
I get my people and we'd go, you know, go to someone's house and cook whatever they want in their own house. And um, there's no such thing as like idle time. Even if there's like, you know, a little break in between courses, you're always doing something. You're always cleaning, putting something away, getting plates ready. So for me, I'll always clean as I go because I hate, I just like in that podcast that I played you, nothing was more real than the idea of wanting to just throw all your dishes away at the end of the night. Toko, what temperature did you put the Instapot at? Right now it's on saute. There's a button on, on an Instapot that says saute. And so that basically just turns it on and turns your Instapot into sort of like a, um, a fry pan. So let me get, you can't hear it right now because I'm not near it, but I'll get my AirPods next to it. You can hear it crackle. Can you hear that? Yeah. So that is fat rendering out of the chicken thigh, which takes a few minutes. I'm just gonna do some more cleaning over here. Do I have any parents in on this Zoom, like judging me right now? I'm just curious. <laughs> okay. So the chicken thighs, so uh, the thing is like, when is it done? Well, it's done when the fat is out, but I usually take it a little bit past that and crisp them up, pull them off the chicken breast and then sprinkle some salt on them and then serve them as a snack. Because um, if you leave the skin on, it might be crispy now, but once it's in a soup, it becomes kind of mushy. And if you've ever had like mushy, soggy chicken skin, it's not the most pleasant texture. It's not horrible, I don't mind it, but you know, it is kind of not super fun. So let's see how we're doing. So those are still browning. Oh, by the way, when you're browning meats like this, you don't want to move it too much. You want to let it stay there. Even if it's like stuck and burned on, if it's done properly, it will release on its own eventually in its due time. So to speed this up, I'm gonna actually, um, I'm gonna render the fat out of some chicken. I have another package here. I'm gonna do this on the stove top over here. And if you've never heard the concept of cross-contamination, you never wanna mix um, raw things. So I just touched raw chicken and every, literally every single time I touch raw chicken, I will go wash my hands with soap. Because you don't wanna to touch raw chicken and then be touching your vegetable, touch your knife what we call cross-contamination. That's how you spread salmonella, which is not fun. Okay, so over here, I'm just gonna um, render out the fat in this chicken thigh just because I'm trying to do a little bit faster. Normally I do it all in one pot. Okay, so let's see how this chicken's doing. So if you look here, that's like a light brown. So typically I'll go further, but just for the interest of time, I'll call that done. So I take them out and hold them separately. That one needs a little bit longer. Yeah, you can see that they're thinner. Like if, this one's actually a little crispy right now, but normally I take it further. But I'm going to set these over here. to get a little loud i'm going to turn my vent on my hood not like annoyingly loud and i'm not looking at the screen right now so you'll have to unmute and tell me so your audio not is really. a bit like yeah it's fine though okay, cool. so if you look here it's a little bit easier excuse me it's a little bit easier to see how much fat so i didn't add any olive oil to this pan nothing so that is just subcutaneous fat being rendered out of the chicken thigh and I always prefer chicken thigh as opposed to chicken breast. Chicken breast to me is boring. It doesn't really have a lot of flavor. Um, so chicken breast is actually one of my last choices. I never understood why restaurants charge more for the chicken breast option. Chicken thigh is where it's at, y'all. So um, you don't have to flip these over because if you look here, there's some fat here, but I don't need to worry about that. I mostly want the fat that's out of the skin side. So you'll notice this cooks way faster than the Instant Pot just because well, the Instant Pot's electric and I've got these like restaurant style power burners over here. 
Okay, so I'll bring these over here. So these are the these are the chicken thighs that I did in the um, in the pot. And if you look here, a lot of fat that just came out of here. So if you look at this, that's probably two tablespoons worth of chicken fat. We call this schmaltz. That's what a good Jewish grandmother of Jewish cooking would call it, schmaltz. So this is gonna go into my Instapot. So now I've got this much chicken fat in my Instapot. Into that goes onion. And I like to put the garlic in at the same time. So this is fresh garlic, about five, six cloves, which is kind of a lot. Most recipes will say like two or three cloves, but you know what? I love garlic. So I'll stir this around a little bit. We call this sweating onions. You just want to cook them till they're softened and a little bit um, translucent. You see little bits of like stuffed chicken skin that are crispy that are coming off the bottom now. So I'll let that sit there for a while. And then I'm gonna bring all my aromatics over. So uh, again, I've got about, I think I measured these. This is half a teaspoon of salt, pink salt. This is quarter teaspoon of parsley, half a teaspoon of thyme, quarter teaspoon of paprika, about an eighth teaspoon of fresh black pepper. And then I've got a couple of bay leaves. <laughs> bay leaves, uh, there's kind of, if you like Google this, a lot of people are like, bay leaves don't do anything. But um, the end, they add a little bit of herbaceousness, like, like a minty profile almost. They just help soups not feel so heavy and fatty, right? So it's a good contrast. But I mean, most of this is optional. Like you don't have to use paprika, you don't have to use bay leaves. Um, Sometimes I'll add cumin if I want to add a little bit of that kind of Mediterranean flavor. Sometimes I'll add cilantro. Um, yeah, kind of depends. So if you look here, hopefully you can see this. They're basically see-through now. Basically see-through. So at this point, I'm going to add the rest of my vegetables. Now, you can skip all of this right here. You could throw everything into one pot right away, throw the chicken in there. Like, you know, if you're rushed for time or just feeling lazy, you can do that. But what does not happen is what I'm doing right now is um, on a hot, like water boils at 212. So if I put everything in here, there's no way it gets above 212. But certain flavor things happen once you get to a certain temperature. I think it's like 335, it's called the Maillard reaction. That's what we call caramelization. So you can kind of intensify flavors by cooking them like this, but you don't have to. Like I said, there's been plenty of times where I've either been in a rush or was just lazy and I just threw everything out of the pot, called it a day. So I'm gonna stir this around a little bit. And this had a little bit of olive oil that I put in, not that much, maybe a tablespoon, maybe less, but it's mostly chicken fat that this is all cooking in right now, okay? So at this point, I'm gonna throw in some of my seasoning. There goes my salt, there goes my parsley, there goes my thyme, there goes my paprika or paprika my salt, stir that up a little bit. So right there, I hope you see the advantage of doing these on blocks, measuring out your stuff beforehand, because it's just boom, 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 boom. And you don't waste any time, you don't run the risk of burning food because you're measuring something out. Okay. So that's almost ready. I've got here um, one quart of chicken stock, can, box, doesn't really matter. So I think this is about ready. If you ever wondered why um, the spout is on one side, it's so that you can pour like this without it going glug, glug, glug and spilling everywhere. But if you're dumping the whole thing, you could just squeeze the whole contents out like this. Kind of yeah. Okay, so there's my one quart of chicken stock. And remember, when you put this in your recycle bin, don't put the lid on. That way it can compact in the back of that trash truck. Okay. 
So that is that. Now I'm going to put my chicken. Oh, I got to take my skin off. Hold on a second. I will remove skin. I will remove skin. And again, you don't have to. It'll just leave a little bit of a mush in your soup. Uh, and you can use different cuts. Like if they don't have chicken uh, uh, skin on, you don't have to do that. You would just have to compensate by adding more olive oil because you do need some kind of fat. So I am off camera peeling skin off the chicken from getting a fry pan. I'm gonna crisp it up in a second and have it as a snack for my children. Because you should know this as a dad, like we don't get anything anymore. Everything goes to the kids. All the good stuff goes to the kids. Have you seen that meme? It's like some mom punched out like stars of cucumbers and ham and they use like a cookie cutter, but then the dad gets all the like leftover stuff of the cutouts. I think that's basically every dad's life. Okay, one more chicken pie. And then we're gonna move on to mac and cheese, y'all. Come on, get off there, okay. Now, so I'm gonna put all the chicken in here. This is no skin now. Just gonna gently drop it in here. So you don't want it splashing all over the place and getting raw chicken juice everywhere. <clears throat> There's a little bit of fat in here. Don't want to miss out on that. Drop that goodness in here. And then, since I just touched not fully cooked chicken, I'm going to go wash my hands with soap. Any questions so far? So, do you have the chicken skin cooking separately on the pan? Yeah, I'll show you that in a second if you want. Wash my hands there first. So, what you want to do next? You'll want to stir the pot a little bit. Gently stir. Now, if you've got things that are like slightly not immersed all the way, like sticking up, it's fine in a pressure cooker like this. Even in a regular pot, it's all gonna kind of mix up anyway. So this is it. That's all you got to do. Um, oh, oh, sorry, bay leaves. Let's throw those in there. Um, here's a side note. Count how many bay leaves you put in, so that when you fish them out later, you know you got them all. It's not a big deal, but you know, nobody likes biting into a bay leaf. So I put four bay leaves in there. Uh, I got all my seasonings. Let me just do a mental check, make sure I put everything in that I usually put in. Great, so uh, I'll go to the Instapot. <clears throat> I'll cancel the saute mode and I'm gonna put it on meat stew. Meat stew, go check it out. So now it's on meat stew. Like I said, it, uh, Instapot is a combination of a pressure cooker plus a slow cooker. Um, close it up, boom, done. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna come up to temperature and then once it's at temperature, it's 35 minutes, done, okay? So let's go over here and get ready for mac and cheese, mac and cheese, everybody's favorite. So, oh, I forgot to mention, so uh, there's some brown rice here, but I'm going to cook this later because, you know, this is for dinner tonight. <clears throat> okay, let's take a pause real quick in between courses to talk about food safety. <clears throat> I know all of you people like me that grew up with Asian parents or minority parents, <clears throat> food safety was never a thing. Like you left food sitting out overnight and it was all good, right? But to be safe, you're supposed to always keep food below 40 degrees or above 140 degrees. <clears throat> so it should either be refrigerated or hot, right? Everything in between is what we call the danger zone. And that's when um, bacteria can multiply, you know, exponentially. So <clears throat> um, even things like white rice, like, you know, Asians, we leave white rice out all the time. Not the safest thing in the world, okay? Um, so just, I want to put that out there make sure we're talking that food safety is a thing, y'all. Uh, uh, hold on. Yeah, let's just let the white rice like dry out. Yep. So I grew up with that too, but it is not the safest thing. Okay, I'm gonna move the milk off of here just because it's gonna spill. But here's my mise en place for mac and cheese, okay? So I've got two tablespoons of butter. That's actually more than two tablespoons because it's butter and butter is life, right? Two tablespoons of just all-purpose flour. I've got about a cup of cheddar, about a half cup of Parmesan, and then this is about I don't know, a cup shredded 
maybe a quarter, uh, three quarters cup of Gruyere. Gruyere is one of my favorite cheeses. Now the cheese you use kind of doesn't matter. I always like to use um, blocks of cheese instead of pre-grated because it melts better. And if you don't know this, but grated cheese always is covered in a cellulose. Um, it's like a, it's like a wood fiber basically, but it's covered in cellulose to prevent it from um, caking. Because if you ever see shredded cheese, it's always like loosey goosey in the bag, right? But if you didn't have that agent, you would just have a clump of cheese in the bag, right? So I always prefer not that stuff. Oh, oh sorry, I didn't explain the other stuff. There is a half teaspoon salt, half teaspoon onion powder, half teaspoon of garlic powder. All optional, the garlic and the onion. I just like it because it adds more flavor. But if you're like, ew, onions, ew, garlic, then, well, I guess you can leave that out. Okay. Hey, Mr. Duncan. So, yeah, what's up? Could you go over the proportions again? Portions, sure. And I'll write this down if you want. So it is roughly two tablespoons butter, two tablespoons all-purpose flour. Uh, cheese is up to you. You could use double the cheese, triple the cheese, and I don't think anybody's going to hate you, right? Mm -hmm. But I would say you want at least a cup of cheese in some form, right? So this is about a cup, maybe a little bit less than a cup of cheddar. There's Parmesan, and then there's Gruyere. G-R-U-Y-E-R-E. -R -E. It's a French cheese. It's kind of like the cheese that's on top of French onion soup. Don't you like French onion soup? That's traditionally a cheese called Emmentaler, a Swiss cheese, Emmentaler. But a lot of times people use Gruyere because it's um, it's a little bit more flavorful, a little bit punchier. So I love Gruyere. Melted Gruyere is like one of the best things in the world. Okay, so give me a second. I'm going to move my mise en place to the stove top area. Uh, I forgot, there's about a cup of milk here too, which I spilled on the floor earlier today, so I had to pour another cup. Yay. Thank you. And again, I can write all this stuff down for you later. Ain't no saying, chicken wing. All right, move this party over here. All right, how's that view? Let's modify this. Good. Okay, so. I've already got some water on a simmer here, so that's ready to boil. I just put all my chicken skins in that same pan and it's on a skillet fired up. Give me two seconds, I'm gonna wash three things right now so my sink is clear for later. Any other questions so far? Isn't this a fun jazz period? It's like we're talking nothing about music, I love it. Imagine showing up to a choir class and it's converted into a cooking class. Well, Mrs. Dyer and I wanted to put like a full-on kitchen in the choir room. Because even before pandemic, we were always talking like, today's generation, they don't do as much as like, you know, they don't know as much domestic stuff because there's so much academic pressure and they're like, oh, you know, you just study, you just do your homework. But when I was a kid, you know, I was a latchkey kid. If you don't know what a latchkey kid is, it means I let myself in the house. I was 10 years old taking the bus home. I would let myself in the house. And if I was hungry, my parents weren't there because they were immigrant parents working two jobs. So if I was hungry, I'd have to make something. And if I didn't make something, I was left to what's in the pantry. I remember a specific times eating a can of olives because I didn't want to make anything, but I was hungry and that's all we had. So, okay, so let me get those chicken skins. And then you'll see making mac is really not that long. In fact, you can cook the pasta at the same time you make the cheese sauce. But I'm gonna do them separately just so I have time to stop and explain things. Okay. Okay, I think it's clear. I'm gonna get my favorite kitchen utensils in a moment for the chicken. Anybody know what my favorite kitchen utensil is? Spatula. <laughs> I think chopsticks are the most useful utensil there is. So this is me frying the chicken skins. As you see, there's even more fat coming out, but I don't need that anymore. So that's basically done. I'm going to turn the heat down on that. Hit it with a little bit of salt. And that is a zero carb, high protein snack. Don't jack a lot though. In fact, I think they sell snacks like that. They sell snacks of um, chicken skin. Okay, so elbow mac, you can use whatever you want. If you want to use like the tea leaf, <clears throat> whatever pasta you use though, 
You want something with either holes or ridges. Like there's a reason why you don't see spaghetti and cheese as your thing, because it's hard for it to bind to the noodle. So if you study Italian pasta, every pasta has a purpose, meaning there's a sauce that's supposed to go with it. So elbows are good, um, corkscrew, fusilli is good, bow tie pasta is good. Anything where cheese can get stuck is a good pasta choice. Okay, so I'm gonna fire up this burner right here. Start melting my butter. Now, I hope this is common knowledge, but if you're using a non-stick surface pan, you should be using not metal utensils. Okay, so this is a silicone whisk. <clears throat> Otherwise, you'll scratch the pan all crazy and it won't be non-stick anymore. That's Are you using a like. wok? Uh, yes, I am. So you don't have to use a wok. I love using woks for everything. I have three woks in here. I'll show you. Would you like to see my wok collection? <laughs> Everybody what? just gift Doko a wok for any kind of occasion. So you can make a spreadsheet. Hey. <laughs> also, how so, much butter? So that was two and, tablespoons, but really it's uh, closer to three. So this okay. is my Chinese wok. This is my super like OG stir mm -hmm. frying wok. Um, wow, I have four woks. Uh, oh, five walks. <laughs> okay, I need to get rid of some of these walks because there's some I never use. So about two tablespoons. Really, this is closer to three because butter is amazing, right? And this is on like a uh, medium low heat. It doesn't need to be on a high heat, but it doesn't need to be on a super low. So I'm melting the butter, okay? And this next part is probably the most important part about making mac and cheese. We're gonna make what's called a roux, R-O-U-X in French, a roux. Okay, and a roux is simply butter, I'm sorry, flour cooked in some kind of fat. In this case, it's butter, okay? So I'm just gonna whisk this all together and I'm literally cooking the flour, okay? So we're making a roux. You wanna do this for about a minute or two. If you go longer and you start browning the butter, that's what we call a brown roux. This is a white roux. So I'm just gonna whisk this all around, lean it. I love whisk, uh, woks for so many reasons. I love woks for pasta and sauces because as you mix to the side up here, it kind of reduces, you know, it evaporates, if you will, it reduces. Uh, it's easy to flip foods. Uh, woks are the best. So I have, this is my only non-stick, no, I have two non-stick woks and apparently now that I see it, I have three steel walks that are not nonstick. But they because I've treated them properly, they basically are nonstick. So I'm gonna turn the heat up on this just a little bit because it's not bubbling as much as I want it to. Oh, it's just about done. Give that another 20 seconds or so. I'm gonna start my pasta. <coughs> Oh, that's hot. So I'm gonna do eight ounces, which is half a one pound bag. I'm only gonna do eight ounces for this. Oh yeah, that's about half a bag. Okay, so super important. When you do pasta, add salt to your water, okay? And it's not to, you know, there's all these misnomers. Oh, it lowers the boiling temperature. It makes your pasta cook faster. Nah, it ain't none of that. It is simply to give your pasta a little bit of flavor, okay? Um, once you put your pasta in, I don't know if you can see this. Can you see what I'm doing over here? Is the camera too far? No, we can see it. It's okay, weird. so I'm just stirring it because a lot of people just throw the pasta in there and walk away, but you're going to end up with like one clump of pasta that's not cooked properly. So give it a good stir. And then the easiest way to make pasta is just to follow the instructions. Alexa, set a timer for five minutes. Boom, shaka. So I'm just gonna let that boil, keep an eye on it so it doesn't boil over. This looks nice and bubbly. You see it's starting to turn a little brown, which means that's done. So I'm gonna get my milk, which has been sitting out at room temperature a little bit. It's not totally cold, which you want. You don't want it to be super cold. So I'm gonna slowly add that. <laughs> And as you can see, it is thickening like bad. Ooh. 
whisk, 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 incorporate, 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 whisk, 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 incorporate, add some more mail, whisk, 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 incorporate, incorporate. Basically, just making like paste. It's like this slurry sludge pastiness. Okay? So that's about a cup of milk in there. Throw that in the sink. Okay. So whisk, 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 whisk. Now, at this point, I'm going to throw in my, my seasoning. So here's salt. Garlic, onion powder, onion powder, get out of there, onion powder. All right, whisk all that together. Just be mindful of your heat. Um, it's really easy to burn and scald this, so don't, don't make it too hot. But more importantly, keep stirring. Oops, let's turn that down. My pasta water starting to put the boiling over. Okay, so if you look here, this looks like a, I don't know, what this look like? Sort of like a cheese sauce, not really, right? Keep stirring until the texture looks even. So all the spices that I put in there kind of look like it's all blended. Okay, still have the heat on. It's on medium low, low, low or medium low, about there. Then I can start putting in cheese. Doesn't really matter what order you put it in. So the function of a roux, like if you try to just melt cheese, it just kind of separates into oil and milk fat and you know, it doesn't look, look goopy. It looks like slimy. So the point of the roux is it's like a binding agent. Get all this goodness out of here. Come on, cheese. Turn the party. Yeah, baby. With that, less cheddar, which gives it the distinct yellow color. And as you can see here, the texture wise pretty much looks like nacho cheese or mac and cheese sauce. It's really uh, smooth, consistent. Then I'm going to put my Gruyere in. Like I said, Gruyere is one of my favorite cheeses because of the flavor. And it's super melty too. Like, you know, some cheeses don't melt as well as others. Like if you've ever had cheddar cheese on a pizza, it almost always separates into oil. You know, it's just like this goopy, sad mass of oil and fat. All right, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. So right now I've just got two cheeses in here. And again, the cheeses you choose, that's up to you. I would just say use good quality cheese. Like if you weren't going to eat it by itself, don't use it in a bag. And then the last cheese I'm going to add is Parmesan. And I like Parmesan because it adds a certain nuttiness. And then it also adds salt. So that's why I didn't add too much salt earlier because the cheeses all have, you know, they have salt in them anyway. All right, so this is almost done. Any questions so far? Any questions? I heard Jess whisking away back there. Keep it up, Jess. <laughs> um, you do have a danger in over whisking and over cooking this because at some point, if you keep the heat on and you keep whisking, it will separate. Okay? And when I say separate, the fat of the, the cheese is going to separate. So you're going to have oil and milk basically separated which is not desirable. So I'm gonna turn the heat down on this because this basically looks done to me. Now, here's an important thing. If you're not gonna eat all this right away, I actually would add a little bit more milk, okay? Just because it stays more liquid longer. Because if you have reheated mac and cheese, anybody know what that's like? It's just like, like chalk. Reheated mac and cheese tends to be chalk, but sometimes I'll make this in big batches and freeze it. And then the kids can just microwave it and it feels like it's sort of fresh. But I do have to add a little bit more milk to that. I'm trying to heat off on this because I'm just going to What's that? You have three cheeses in there, right? Correct. But that's just me. You can do one. Mm -hmm. You can do 17. You can do whatever you want. I would stay away from like really strong cheeses like blue cheese. Mm -hmm. um, but you could try it. It might get real funky. Actually, I have some room for French blue cheese. I could throw that in there, but my kids are going to be like, I smell my cheese. Yeah, because I was going to ask, like, is there like a certain combination of cheese that would be like nasty or like wouldn't work? Yeah, I could think of plenty. We could talk about that in a minute here. Okay, okay for sure. timer. So um, my pasta says five to seven minutes. And I did five minutes just because I know it's going to keep cooking as I put it in the cheese sauce here a little bit. So let me get this off the heat. Alexa, off. So I'm going to, well, how should I do this? Yeah, I'll do a call. Where you at? 
where are you at, my stuff? Okay, I'll just do this. So this is what we call a spider in the kitchen. It's just a strainer. So I'm gonna do this because I want a little bit of the pasta water in my sauce because it helps, well, it helps with a few, a few things, but I, I want a little bit of water. I don't want the pasta totally bone dry. So I'm just gonna scoop it up like this. Get most of the water out, but there's still a decent amount of water in the pasta. Now you can use a colander if you wish, whatever you want. Some of this water real quick. Okay, that's the last of it with a little bit of water. I'm gonna use a rubber spatula to turn and fold all this into each other. So you can see it looks a little watery right now, but I like it that way just in case there's leftovers, it tends to still resemble mac and cheese instead of being like a brick. So this is basically done. I don't know if you're OCD like me, but I love it when the sides of the walk are super clean. Like right here, this bothers me right there. This bothers me right there. What doesn't bother me is seeing it clean like that. Oh, it's very, it's like a clean whiteboard, you know, like that. That probably annoys some of you, right? Right there, that little, you know, zoom in so you can. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's basic mac and cheese. Now, at this point, if you wanted to be fancy, uh, my kids don't really like it, so I don't do it. But you can add Japanese breadcrumbs, panko breadcrumbs, which adds a little bit of crunch, a little bit of texture. And if I'm being super fancy, I will add white truffle oil. If you've never had truffle oil, it's um, sort of a indescribable flavor. It's sort of like mushrooms, but not really. It's earthy. It's, um, yeah, it's really hard to describe. But if you want to try it, Trader Joe's actually has a bunch of truffle flavored stuff. They have like a truffle popcorn, truffle chips. Uh, I think they sometimes sell a truffle butter. So yeah, um, you can dress up mac and cheese any way you want. So it's basically done. So if you look here, um, you can't really tell, but I can tell it's not gritty because if I look at the what's on the bottom here, all of that looks homogeneous. Because some cheeses, like if you use a lot of cheddar, especially if you use like a mild cheddar, it can be a little gritty, which is kind of hard to describe, but it just feels like it's almost like sandy, but not quite. It just feels like there's like unmelted or unmixed, unincorporated things. There you go, done. Ta-da, so two dishes in about an hour. Question. No questions. Everyone's either sleeping or cooking right now, is what I'm guessing. How much would you say this is a serving size for? That's probably half a G-back right there. Um, so like 12. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So what, what I did right there is probably just enough for my kids for lunch. So that's probably three kids serving or two adult servings, if that's your main course. If it's a side dish, this probably makes, you know, four, six servings of a the side. But I mean, the thing with serving sizes with mac and cheese is everybody eats mac and cheese, right? It's like, I've, I've met very few people that are like mac and cheese, you know, that's disgusting. I mean, sure, they might be talking about craft mac and cheese, like the boss mac and cheese, but I feel like everybody likes a good, you know, homemade mac and cheese that's made with fresh cheese, um, you know. But yeah, I would say what I just did served as a main, maybe three people, two, three people. 
Actually, let me take a look at it again. Hold on, I'm watching the dishes over here. As a main course of mac and cheese for adults, this is probably three servings. Two large adult servings. Like here, look. Yeah, that's kind of a lot, right? So I'd say three or four adult servings, maybe. GVAC could probably finish this whole thing, although it actually, to be honest, it would be a lot for you. A little. But um, if you make a whole, like if you double the recipe here and use a full bag of pasta, that's easily, you know, eight adult servings. Six, eight adult servings, yeah, probably. Other questions? How much would I'll this all the cost in total? How much would, um, what? Oh, the rest of the cost, like the, like the, okay. uh, yeah. So uh, when it comes to buying ingredients, things can either be cheap or affordable simply based on whether you use the entire product or not. Like say you made mac and cheese, which required you to buy a half pound block of cheddar, but you only use like a quarter of it and threw the rest of it away. Does that make sense? It's like, it depends on if you buy things that are usable. Uh, in terms of just unit price, like just, um, like if I only paid for the amount of cheese that I used, I would say, let's do the math. A bag of pasta is about two bucks. Um, the amount of celery I used was probably like 50 cents. Um, carrots was probably about a buck. Uh, it's probably eight bucks or so, maybe six bucks, eight bucks to make this whole thing based on just the quantities I used. Obviously, like I had to buy a block, like how much is this block? It was like the Gruyere, the little chunk of Gruyere was six bucks and the cheddar was $3 and 14 cents. So it kind of depends on that chicken. Um, this chicken stew has 26 minutes left, by the way. Um, <clears throat> it can be pretty affordable because carrots, celery and onions, that mirepoix, that holy trinity we call it, can be used in so many things. You could use a pasta sauce, you could do a soup, you could do um, meatballs, just so many things are built on that flavor combination of celery, onions, and carrots. So yeah, these, these meals that I just made are not meant to be like luxurious or expensive. They're meant to be, you know, doable for a college freshman, you know, because I mean, let's face it, most college freshmen aren't rolling in dough and be like, hey, you guys want to come over for some duck breast and foie gras and some, you know, French champagne? No, it's usually like, you guys want to come over for McDonald's and like, whatever cheap wine that I sold from my parents. That's probably what it is, if we're being real. Other questions? Anything. So Jess, did you cook on your side? Yeah, I'm almost, my pasta's still cooking, but I'm almost done. Nice. I'll be curious how yours came out. Uh, so the thing with mac and cheese is you could do it absolutely any way you want in terms of cheeses, pastas. You could use whatever you've got laying around the house, like say there's some cheddar. And by the way, if you all you have is like shredded cheddar cheese already, you can use it. It's not like a no-no. Uh, it's just not my preference. So if you've got like that big bag of Costco, you know, that four cheese combo thing. Um, yeah, I've used that. I've used that to make mac and cheese, no problem. It's just that that cellulose can make it gritty. Just cause it's mostly because that cellulose doesn't homogenize very well with the cheese and the roux and everything else. So, yeah, I am getting my rice ready. That's too. My rice can cook off something, by the way. What else you got, team? I'm gonna do some dishes if you don't have anything for me. I have not been looking at the chat at all, so I don't know what's going on in there. Did I miss anything in the chat? Were there any questions in the chat? The last thing that's mentioned here is it smells like feet. I think you're good. Oh. <laughs> Uh, by the way, um, mac and cheese is really easy to incorporate other things. Like if you want to add veggies to it, or if you want to add a protein, you know, mac and cheese kind of 
lends itself to anything. Like there's very few foods that don't go with cheese, right? So <clears throat> if you wanted to add broccoli, that's a really common combination. Like broccoli cheddar, you know, it's a soup for goodness sake. Um, by the way, making a broccoli cheddar soup is not that different than what I just did. So if you like broccoli cheddar soup, it starts with a roux and a mirepoix. You know, you make a roux to make the cheesy base of the sauce. You add potatoes to make it thicken, you know. But um, yeah, it's basically the same thing. Use a roux and you add some broccoli at the end. That's a broccoli cheddar soup. If you want to make meatballs, you take a, a sofrito, which is basically a mirepoix, just finer dice and with olive oil instead of butter. And then you um, make those small dice and that's how you make meatballs. Like a lot of people think meatballs is just a chunk of meat. But if you've ever had just a chunk of meat, it's not that tender. It's like a, it's like a baseball, right? So it needs vegetables. And one of the magic ingredients of a good meatball is egg and breadcrumbs. That's what makes it uh, magical. The breadcrumbs keep it moist and the egg acts as a binder, like a glue. I love eggs. Eggs are one of the most magical um, kitchen items. You can use them in baking, in cooking. I mean, everything. Shoot, there's a bridge in Prague the Charles Bridge in Prague, it's rumored they put thousands of eggs in there to make the concrete stronger. That's like the old legend. But people have always believed in, you know, think about it, eggs can do so many things. It's in bread, it's in macarons, it's in ice cream, uh, it's in souffle, it's in uh, any savory egg dish, omelets, lots of options. Oh, that went faster than I thought. I didn't think that would go that fast. I've never actually made chicken soup and mac and cheese at the same time on camera. Actually, this is the first time I've done this. I've never actually done like a cooking tutorial thing on camera. Worked out, I think, yeah? Was it like visible? You could see everything you needed to see? For sure. Like if, if I was like a professional, I'd have someone following me around with the camera. And then I would overpronounce everything like Giada. So now that you've got the pancetta, you want to render the fat, fat out of the pancetta as you get ready to fill it in the ravioli. Every word I swear is just <laughs> super overpronounced. I love it. Uh, okay. Other questions? Any comments? Any anything? So, go ahead, Jivat. I was just wondering: um, is this recording going to be available on like Canvas or something? Um, I don't know. I can do whatever you want. I'll put it on Canvas. I'll put it on Google. Google Drive is probably the best because Canvas is probably going to kick it back because it's too big. Okay. So um, here, I'll show you. I'll grab my camera. So if you look here, because I was cleaning as I went, um, so that pot I used for pasta, that's all clean already. These have food in it. But I'm clean. I have no dishes to do right now. So that's all the utensils and little mixing bowls that I used. Those are the other mixing bowls. My cutting board is clean and dry. My knife, I just put away this bad boy right here. So yeah, cleaning as you go is such an important thing because it keeps you sane. Make sense, everybody? So I'm a big proponent of cleaning as you go. Oops, I dropped some flour on the ground now. Let's grab that. Um, yeah, I, I totally understand the budget concern. Like, what can I make that's cheap? So understand that some produce is cheaper than others. Like potatoes are probably the cheapest um, food item out there. Next to that would be um, anything that grows fast. Like I would say onions, maybe carrots, things that grow fast generally, uh, grow fast and grow year round. Those are generally things that are a little bit more affordable. Um, fresh produce like broccoli can be a little bit more expensive unless you're getting frozen stuff, you know? So um, as we talk about budgeting, like that'll be one of our future conversations. That should be something you think about. It's like, okay, I've got, I've got $38 for groceries this week. How do I make $38 stretch without feeling super trashy? Meaning without eating like 69 cent cheeseburgers all week, right? Um, so yeah, we can, we can talk about that. We can talk about pricing things out. What else? What did you do to the chicken skin again? You just put it in the, whatchamacallit? Yes, yeah, so I put it, in a, put it in a fry pan. 
Nothing wrong with that. Like, why waste it, right? If it's not going to end up in the soup as a final product, don't waste it. Eat it. Same thing for the bones. Like, once you make the bones, oh, by the way, bones also help make soup taste better because of the marrow inside the bone, if you all know your biology, the marrow inside the bone is what gives flavor. So, generally speaking, that's why bone in steaks are so popular and more expensive because they're going to taste better. How'd it come out, Jeff? Okay, is my, can you hear me this way? Yes, yeah. I can hear you, but there's a feedback loop. <laughs> All right, what else? I mean, if you got no other questions, I can let you go. But um, talk, think about like what you want to do next, or what you want me to do next. Like, if you've always wondered how to make blank, or what's the cheapest way to do this, or you know, I could think of plenty of other um, things that would be good for a freshman student, like casseroles, or like lasagnas, or like a red sauce. Um, yeah, those are all things that could feed you and a, and a bunch of your friends, and are not super expensive. Um, Wait, can we possibly make lasagna in the near future? Yeah, I'll do lasagna for the next one if you want. Okay. Lasagna tends to be a little bit more labor intensive because you've got to prep things separately, but it's not crazy. And I think the payoff is good, right? And the other cool thing about a lasagna is there's 10 billion ways to do lasagna. You know, you could do a vegetarian lasagna, you could do a sausage, you could do a pizza lasagna. I've seen people do pizza lasagnas where they put pepperoni on top and mozzarella cheese. Um, there's kind of no limit to what you can do with lasagna, right? Lasagna just freeze well too. Uh, in terms of like cooking utensils, what would you say are like the main ones? Cooking utensils, I think you, um, everybody needs a good knife. That is the number one thing I'd say. Mm -hmm. And when I say good knife, it should fit your hand properly like here. <clears throat> So if you look at my other, I'm on two screens if you didn't figure that out already. So all my knives are global knives. You can tell by the handle. They're all made by <clears throat> Global's a Japanese company. They used to make, long, long time ago, they used to make samurai swords and now they make kitchen knives. So I figured that's good enough for me. But if you look at the handle here, it's a little hefty. This is Vanessa's knife. So her handle's a little bit smaller, okay? Um, I say it's important to get something that fits your hand, but also something that you can keep sharp because people think that they get like sharp knives are what cut people actually dull knives are what cut people because you end up forcing the cut and then, <clears throat> you know, you end up like slipping and chopping your finger off. But with super sharp knives, like you barely have to work. You just kind of mm -hmm. slide and glide. Uh, but I'd say you need at least one, one chef's knife like this. This is a chef's knife. Uh, okay, I'll show you all my knives. This is a bread knife. You can tell by the serrations and how long it is, but bread knives are also, I use them for tomatoes. I use them for anything like carving. If I've got a roast or something, I'll do that. This is a, a boning knife and a boning knife is flexible. What the? And it springs right back, see? So it's called a boning knife because you're supposed to go like under the skin of fish and like skin it off like that and carve in and around bones. So that's a flexible boning knife. Uh, this is um, a smaller utility knife. It's also serrated. This is my little baby paring knife. My little baby paring knife. Uh, this is my bird's beak. So this is a super over the top knife that I use for like three things, but I'm a junkie. So uh, it's for making particular cuts in vegetables called a tournelle. It's for making little football shapes out of your um, vegetables 
that was a totally unnecessary purchase, but <laughs> this is my itty bitty bearing, um, pairing knife. And where's my favorite knife? Uh, where'd I put my favorite? Oh, here it is. So this is my, let me put my thing for this. So my absolute favorite knife that I don't use often because it's very specific is my sashimi knife. So, so this is my sashimi knife. It's 14 inches long. It has single bevel edge. So you probably can't tell on camera, but it's angled like this and like this. So it's um, flat on one side and angled on the other. And um, it's meant to be cut in one direction only. Meaning you just saw, you cut through your knife, your fish like that. You're not supposed to saw at it like this. If you've ever been to sushi, they're almost always using a sashimi knife. It's long so that you can make your cut on one stroke. And these things are stupid sharp. So this is my second one that I have. This is my, I had a cheaper one before I upgraded to this. I remember the first time I used it, I actually cut the tip of my finger and didn't even know it until I was bleeding. There was no pain because it was that sharp. It just went through like, and I was like, whoa, that's terrifying. But um, yeah, I would say everybody needs a, a good quality knife. And then after that, um, I would say cookware is what matters. Cause you know, you can cook with garbage spatulas. You can cook with whatever. These are my fancy chopsticks, by the way. These were a birthday present for myself. Oh. Mahogany wood, some, some bone right here. But this is what I use for like fancy plating. Like if I have to put something like right there on the plate and you know, be all fancy. So these are Moribashi chopsticks. But given COVID, I never have people over, so. Oh yeah, this, this is um this is an even babier glove. But this is Sammy's and this is Ellie's tiny little gloves. Can you go through like yeah. the uses for each knife? What's that? Can you go through like the uses for each knife? Yeah, so your basic knife is what we call a chef's knife. Just if you know it is what a chef would normally use. This is what I use like 90% of the time. Okay. If you notice it's hollow ground right here, there's little like indentations. That's supposed to make food release a little bit easier, but you know, it kind of does and kind of doesn't. I would say this is the main knife you need to have. The second knife, if you're only to have two knives, I would say it would be to have a bread knife, okay? Because with this, I, I can cut large pieces of stuff like roasts or turkeys, tomatoes, bread, everything. If you're gonna have three knives, I would add a paring knife. And a paring knife is for doing small work, like cutting vegetables or peeling an apple. Um, those are the only three knives you really need. After that, you're just, you're being a nerd like me, right? Um, and you don't have to spend a fortune on knives, but you do have to take care of your knives. Like for example, this is a like $10 knife that I bought like 15 years ago, but I sharpen it. So it's fine, right? Um, you don't have to spend a lot. Oh, I didn't show you this knife. This is my homicidal. Maniac knife. This is my high is there a hole? So this weighs 450. Uh, it's meant for hanging it up. Uh, uh. If you want to hang it up. But this is for um, if I'm butchering large amounts of like chicken, especially if I'm just going, if I'm chopping like, you know, whatever. So this is the weight of the knife cuts for you. How do you sharpen so this? This is also overkill. Uh, good question. So there's three main options for sharpening a knife, and I have them all right here somewhere. Um, one, two, and three. Okay. You've probably seen this. It's a sharpening steel, honing steel. Usually you see it done like this, right? You've seen this in shows. You've seen this in Ratatouille, for goodness sake. That That's how the sharpener on Ratatouille. Oh my God. Yeah, so this oh. is a knife sharpener. This does not do that great of a job. This is meant for like every time I cook, I'm going to sharpen a little bit. Okay, just a little bit. Now, I don't use this often because it's, like I said, it's not that great. I use this. This is a wheel sharpener. So what I do is you fill this base with water and the water acts as a lubricant. And you just, um, and if you, I'll take that part. There's these ceramic wheels and they're at an angle such that when your blade goes through it, it keeps it at the bevel angle that your knife is supposed to be at. I'd have to show you a graphic on this, but um, I use this. So I'll just fill this with water and every two to three times I use my knife, I do this. I fill it with water, I run it through the medium, um, the medium wheel like six or seven times and then the fine wheel six or seven times. I never use the coarse wheel unless I've broken my knife, right? So those are the quickest ways. The best way, which takes the most time, and I only do this once, twice, three times a year, 
We used to use what we call a whetstone. We soak this in water. And I'm sure you've seen this in like old school movies where they're like sharpening it against the stone. That's what this is. That's a whetstone. So there's a coarse side and there's a fine side. And this is what I'll use if I need to, like if I've got time and I want to kind of recondition my knives, that's what I'll do. Um, or alternatively, a lot of people just take their knives to a service. They'll just take it to a professional knife sharpener and that's fine too. Other questions? Yeah, now that I'm done cooking, everything's clean. Everything either needs to be dried or drip dried, but we're done, we're good to go. So that's the importance of both mise en place, putting everything in its place before you start and cleaning as you go. Two super critically important things for an efficient kitchen. And we're not talking about restaurants, just your own home kitchen. I think it's good to have, you know, some, some system, some order. What else you got? Good question so far. Um, I would say for me, I learned cooking by trial and error. So just try, cook, you know, I've done some weird things. My wife can tell you I've, you know, given her a couple of random dishes that were like, what is this? Like we have a famous inside joke of using too much white pepper, which ruined the dish. Um, so it happens like, you know, I've, I've been cooking for a long time, but I'll still mess stuff up if I'm being either careless, reckless, or not paying attention. But it's okay. You learn from your mistakes. Is that not is that not what we talk about in choir? If you're not making mistakes, we're not learning. We're not moving forward. If everything feels like it's easy, guess what? You probably still sound like you did in third grade, right? So push it, y'all. Push it. Um, if there's nothing else, I can let you go. I mean, we're basically at time anyway. I have so I wanna to... Yeah. Oh. Oh, uh, since you have a sashimi knife, like how easy would it to do sushi? Oh, easy. So when Vanessa had her, when she was in the hospital, her first meal was I brought fish to the hospital, my sashimi knife, and I carved it table side in her recovery room and she had fish. Cause you know, you're not supposed to have raw fish when you're pregnant. Well, technically you're not supposed to have it while you're nursing either, but whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's great. But like I said, a sashimi knife is basically one purpose and one purpose only. For sure cutting fish All right. but there's nothing like it though anything else so i'm going to follow on um the next lesson we'll talk about kind of like you know knife skills and like there's a whole french lesson on um knife cuts like what is a mince what is a baton what is a batonette what is a Tournelle. like they have all these names of cuts. So if you go to any good quality restaurant and the chef says, I need these carrots and turnel, yes, chef. And they know exactly what it's supposed to look like, baton, or, you know, fine dice, coarse dice, blah, blah, blah. I love that kind of stuff. We good? For now? Okay. Um, I'm going to see you all tomorrow for chamber. And then um, I don't see you until Tuesday. And then Tuesday, we'll kind of, we'll do a follow-on lesson for this. Okay. Oh, um, could you let us know when you upload this or if you upload it? Yeah, I'll do it right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.